Okay. Right. I just wonder, yes, if it's uh, the time to start speaking already. Uh, but let's, yeah, let's hope uh, it is. Uh, and um, hello, everyone. Good evening uh, to those who are, who is based in, in Moscow and uh, some other countries which are closer to Moscow than uh, New York, because New York is somewhere where it's 12 uh, p.m. And I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome Otto von Busch, who has uh, who is joining uh, us today for this uh, session. And uh, just a few uh, words about uh, the whole event, why we are here, what are we doing here? And uh, I was just uh, telling Otto about our new initiative, uh, the new uh, lab research project, which was just launched by um, uh, the Doctoral School of Art and Design, High School of Economics and uh, Design School, uh, Moscow, Mandate Research Lab. And uh, Otto's talk today is uh, the first uh, public event uh, of our lab. So thank you. And, um, I just uh, say a few technical things. Uh, we are here in Zoom together, but and uh, the whole lecture will uh, be held in English. But our um, uh, stream uh, on YouTube cha channel, which is uh, which is organized by New Literary Observer, our partner in crime, uh, the publisher of uh, Russian fashion series, uh, that stream will be in Russian. So those of you who need desperately. Uh, to listen to this conversation in, in English, please let us know. Uh, and um, so that's it, let's start. Uh, and um, um, I would like to introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Otto von Busch, Associate Professor in Integrated uh, Design um, at Parsons School of Design, New York. Otto, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Otto is going to talk about, well, patching up, mending practices in design. So, Otto, please, the floor is yours. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I thought of, I will just share my screen and show some images of some projects and things that I've been working on. Um, and, um, uh, and then I guess we take questions and things after that, I guess. Yeah. So, so, all right, I will just, I have sort of put together some small examples of practices that I have been working with and recording in progress uh, and you know issues that I have encountered and tried to sort of put my attention to so so that's what I will be be, be sort of talking about all right so so just a little background to to me and my practice so I am I did my PhD in at Gothenburg University in in Sweden and I finished that in 2008 and I, it was a thesis called Fashion Able, and, and the idea was to try to look at sort of fashion as, a, as an operating system of today, and how could it be hacked, basically? What could we learn from what was then sort of the new media practices, you know, new media at the time, and now, now it's old media. Uh, but that um, just a few years later, in 2011, I got hired at Parsons, so uh, I am based at, in, in New York since 10 years, basically at the new school and Parsons is part of the new school um, and um, I sort of in my work I you know teach general design students but also fashion students and to me it's it's an interesting place to be Parsons because it is part of this kind of progressive institution that the new school has been for a long time uh, and Parsons is this kind of you know design especially famous for its fashion school. So there's a sort of a tension between a sort of an, you can say an academic side, which is a little bit more critical and has a, uh, a, a progressive and Marxist history versus the sort of more capitalist oriented, if you want to say so, school that is very, has a very strong position within the fashion field and close uh, connections to the fashion industry. So to me, the interesting part is trying to sort of, you know, what, what are ways to think about fashion in the sort of the tension between these two fields? And being a person is, is you know, it's, 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 a, it's an interesting place to, to, to try this out in that sense. Uh, so what I try to do in a lot of my work is to sort of think twice about what fashion is and how are we to, you know, think about fashion outside of perhaps of the industry. Um, the way that I usually 
talk to my students is that, you know, where do you encounter fashion? Where do you encounter the way that the, the realm we call fashion? And most often it is exactly in the media feeds on the phone, you know, it's in the shopping mall, so in the shops, you know, so fashion is the way we habitually think about fashion and encounter fashion is through the commodity world or through the medialized world. We don't often talk about fashion as something that we encounter between friends, so between peers, as a way that actually sort of affects us in a sense, you know, that it, it is comfortable and, and a very industry-oriented way of looking at what fashion is in that sense, you know. So today I, I try to look at how can we challenge this to think differently in a sense of what fashion is. Um, and to me, I, I enjoy these two images from the sartorialist sort of street fashion blog from many years ago, but it captures a little bit this kind of, you know, on the one hand, we have this fantastic fascination we can feel looking at fashion, especially being young, you know, that, that fashion can be this kind of magical world where we can dress up and we can be anyone. And, it, you know, and, and my, my children, when they were younger, they loved to, you know, dress up for, of course, you know, Halloween costumes come now, you know, uh, because it's season. But in a sense, you know, pyjama day at school or, or dressing up in a costume for school was a big event, you know, something really fun. And, but at the same time, there is this tension too, that, that somehow, you know, we also feel the, the pain that is on the ima other image, you know, the, the possibility of humiliation even, you know, when it comes to clothing. So there's this tension when, when we come to, to the way that we dress between enormous pleasure and imagination, but also an extreme, uh, you know, possibility of being wounded. You know, we are told that we shouldn't care about clothes, you know, and that's often how we grow up that, you know, oh, you, know you shouldn't judge people by the surface. And, you know, at the same time, as we know that that is not true, you know, we are always judged, you know, and there's something that is deeply personal in that. Um, and, and coming back to children, you know, we love to dress up when we're young, but somehow throughout school, we, all of us, most of us end up in sort of, you know, jeans and a t-shirt or something very normal in the end, you know, and that is our habitual way of dressing, even though we could dress in so many different ways. What is it that makes us so scared in a sense, you know, and, and feeling that we need to align with what is expected of us in that sense. And so, so, so fashion, we can discuss fashion as a commodity, we can discuss fashion as an industry, but there's also something about fashion as this deep emotional investment that we can have in clothing that we are not always very articulate about, you know, and how can we, how can we think about this and, and find words and the language that speak about this deep engagement that we can also have with fashion. And this has to do with also what we call this kind of democratization of fashion that fashion has gone through over the last decades, you know, where, you know, what we call fast fashion or cheap and accessible on, on trend fashion has been more and more accessible and available to a wider scope of populations across the world because the price point has gone down so much with much more efficient supply chains and production chains. And of course, you know, there's a tension there, but who, who has this democratization been for in that sense? You know, for the consumers, well, they can buy more things of different styles than before, but do they have a voice? Can they actually affect the system? Can they hold people responsible? We don't see much of that. You know, in, or is it democratization for designers? Well, designers can pick and choose from more efficient supply chains, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we have a wider scope of styles accessible and a wider sort of design practices that designers are utilizing because it's more open in that sense. You know, most designers still work with a very narrow industry and they're trying to sort of produce on trend for the high street, et cetera. And of course it has not been a democratization for the workers, you know, which are, you know, subject to extreme, you know, um, uh, abuse in many of these, so, you know, along the whole supply chain, you know, and that can come from anything from the, you know, unpaid internships in the offices here in New York to of course overseas, 
factories and so on. So this democratization is a very narrow way of talking about what has happened in the industry and it's very much on economic terms. And it hasn't necessarily deeply affected the way that we actually practice fashion over these last you know, um, uh, generation, we can say. You know, we, we still sort of treat fashion in a very similar way and we educate fashion designers in a very similar way. Of course, now we try to make them a little bit more aware of sustainability and so on, but we still have this sort of, you know, the, the basic operating system is still in place, especially when it comes to, to education. So we can think a little bit like, what is it that fashion does with us and does to us, you know? And one way is to think about fashion as, you know, a certain form of attention, you know, that fashion guides our attention in certain ways, you know? And, and of course, you know, one way to look at it is, is what we perhaps often think that these commodities help us do. And that is to, you know, gain attention and be seen in a favorable light, you know, to dress in fashion is always right. You know, you always do the good thing. You always do the right thing if you dress in fashion, in that sense, you know, you're sort of safe, you know, and, and hopefully people will look at you and you get, you know, a sort of adoration by the attention that fashion brings. And I think that is what at least fashion sells us, you know, that is what the media and the advertisement and what we sort of, when we look at influencers, we do the same kind of thing. You know, we guide our attention to them we adore them and we hope that we can also be part of that you know kind of gain that kind of attention but of course that's a very narrow scope of also what is attention in that sense because this is also an attention that is very in the way that the fashion system operates it's an attention that is non committing you know it's an attention where the whole idea is that i in the next second will will attend to something else you know i don't have to you know, pay attention in that sense that I actually have to invest in a sense and, and, and actually commit to my attention. You know, the whole idea is that I, you know, it's a transitory form of attention. And this is, of course, what, you know, commodity economy does to us, you know, that, that what we call this fast fashion and what we call consumerism perhaps in general today is a sense of, of non-commitment, you know, that, when I buy my, my, you know, a, a coffee in a takeaway mug to, you know, have it to go, the whole idea with that transaction is that I don't have to commit coming back with the cup. It just goes to trash. You know, the whole idea is that we actually have no real attention of commitment. I don't need to care about the container. I don't need to care about after the point of purchase, I should never, I should be out of my mind. You know, and this is similar, of course, the way that we often treat fashion and, and, and much of our consumerism in general, that we don't have to recycle it in that sense. We don't have to repair it. We don't have to invest anything else into it. It, it is all on our, uh, you know, um, if I don't have to, if I don't want to care, I don't have to care. I don't have to commit in any way. You know? and, and we can think about like what that, you know, how that affects us in a more wider scope, you know, because of course we can say that this is a general trend also in how social relationships work too, you know, that a lot of the way that social media and the way that we are treating or that these interfaces treat social relationships too, is that we don't have to commit to social relations in that sense. We can always ghost out, you know, we can always, oh, send the busy message, even though we're not busy, et cetera, et cetera, you know? which is also very different than it was perhaps just a generation ago where you didn't know who was calling. So you had to take the phone and it was a bit of sort of roulette. It could be someone that was not so nice. Now you can just block them and just take them out of your, of your world. So the sense of non-commitment, the sense of what consumerism does to us is not only related to the realm of commodities. It is actually affecting a wider scope of, of our, you know, our mental world too. And it's good just to think about that because if we are gonna change the fashion system in that sense, we are facing not only an industry and people's sort of uh, you know, values, but ingrained practices, habits that we have grown over the last generation, we can say, of non-commitment, you know, that, that we have to sort of turn a quite big ship as we are gonna turn towards more sustainable 
practices, and we need to to be aware that that this there's, there's, there's much going on here. So we can think of also, you know, attention that is not about adoration, then you know, an adoration or, or attention that wants to look at someone to influence us, wants to look at someone to, you know, to feel that we are seen and acknowledged. We can also think that attention is a form of care. You know, it is a commitment, you know, that we have to do to pay attention to something. To that means that we sort of, you know, we block out a little bit of the world in order to focus on something that we care about, you know, that we put our attention, invest our intention into. Uh, at the same time, it, it is worrying, and perhaps you also, you know, it's especially apparent in English language, how much of an economic language we use when it comes to attention, you know. And again, you know, we pay attention, we invest in care, etc. you know. So it's also that we just also need to be aware that there's a lot of of how an economic way of thinking affects a lot of the terminology that we use when we want to also address these issues. So that we need to you know, just be careful there in the sense of, of what we are trying to, to do. And is it possible to, you know, to balance this economic language of investment and paying and so on with much more uh, attentive types of, of language? These are repair kits from my grandmothers that I collected through uh, you know, my relationship with them. Um, and there are things that have you know, been along my journey for a long time, but they also you know, are a way for me to, to think about you know, how much they put attention to things and how much to them they put you know, uh, uh, attention to care in that sense. And of course, you know, they grew up or, or, or were, you know, lived through both of the, of the world wars in Finland and, and Sweden and Germany. And exactly, my grandfather was, was born in St. Petersburg. But, you know, so they, they sort of, you know, lived through a life that was very different than this type of, of uh, you know, consumer society we live in today. But I still think there's an interest, you know, in the way that these tools are sort of made and were present in ways that, that put attention to family and put attention to the lasting of you know, making things last. And we'll come back to that. So, so to me, it's the interesting part here is in the sense of when we talk about sort of patching up and when we talk about repairs and uh, you know, apply this to, to clothing, we're actually talking about something that is in a sense much larger. You know, it is on a material level. Yes, we are sewing and patching up things, but we are also actually trying to sort of handle attention that consumerism, the sort of democratization of consumerism and the change in our you know, basic value systems and habits that are, you know, being present at the tip of the needle and the thread that we're working with, you know. So I will just show some examples of work that I have engaged with and, and initiated that has to do with, you know, questions of repair and how to sort of think about perhaps ways we could work with clothing and fashion in other ways than what we see in this sort of, you know, the consumer's society and the way that fashion sort of habitually operates with us. You know. And this was a project I did together with students at London Culture Fashion um, in 2012, perhaps it was? No, earlier, nine, 10, there around something, um, which is called community repair. And the basic starting point of this, of this project was the idea that perhaps we could think differently what repair does, that not necessarily thinking that when I repair an object, I'm trying to re, you know, move it backwards in time to a state before it was damaged, you know, that perhaps I can think of repair as something that I'm adding something else to the process, you know, I'm adding something. So the repair itself becomes a vehicle to do more than just repair the immediate sort of garment and the damage on a certain garment. So in this sense, the idea was to sort of open the repair process to a community to also try to sort of connect a community with the process of, of repair. So could we use garments as vehicles or in a sense of as, as you know, uh, hooks <laughs> that we tie up society and our community with in that sense. And the basic starting point of this project uh, that I did with the students was that they had to start with a garment that needed some sort of mending 
or repair or alteration that they had in their wardrobe. And the question was then, you know, how could they engage their community, their local community within their their local post, you know, zip code, we used the postal code as the area that they would work with. What could they find there as a resource that could help them repair the garment? Because they were not allowed to do it themselves. Someone else had to do the repair for them, but they had to barter with them to give something back to this person for the repair in that sense. And the repair had to leave some sort of trace onto the garment that they were working with. You know, So the whole idea was that the, the community that they formed, in a sense, would actually leave traces <laughs> in the garment and they would actually then sort of carry their community in the repair that they had made. In that sense. Um, and Emily Towers was one of the students. And uh, so she <laughs> actually broke for the first rule because she said, I cannot do it within my zip code. I was, you know, she was commuting uh, back and forth in the weekends to her parents in Paris, if I remember it right. So she was on the Eurostar train, but she said that well, that's a great opportunity to, to perhaps engage people there in the, on the train. Well, I mean, we're on a train. So what she did was that she engaged the community and started talking to people there, how they could help out her to alter and, and repair this, this hood, the, 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 the jacket that she was having. And then she also talked to a, a local sort of um, a community center where she was living that also, you know, donated some of the fabrics and so on, if I remember it right. But the basic idea was that she, you know, the whole riding, <laughs> the red riding hood with the, with the wolf on became a sort of a process of, of where this garment sort of transformed because the way that she was talking and working with her community. And then, you know, went, and the train journey became a lot of this, you know, um, that produced the patches that she was then you know, uh, working with as, as a form of decoration onto the jacket. So in a sense, I mean, of course you can say that, well, you know, perhaps this is a bit over ambitious. Most probably it was not so damaged, you know, as the needing this much repair. But at the same time, you know, it, the, the jacket became something much, much more in a sense than now just repaired in that sense, you know. So have the patch from the elbow in a sense perhaps, you know, grow up into something much, much larger. Benet Lutke was a, another student who had a community center around the corner where there were some uh, elder ladies that did a, were part of a hat making workshop where they transformed various types of garments into hats and, and also you know, felted hats and so on. Uh, so he brought his father's shirt there, an old shirt of his father's, and uh, that they transformed into two hats, if I remember right. And he paid back by taking portrait photos of them, you know, so that was part of the exchange that he took photos of them uh, with, his, with his camera. And then they, you know, uh, as part of the workshop, transformed his shirt, the um, shirt into a hat. So also here again, you know, the, the idea was that something, you know, there was also a barter of skill exchange in that sense, you know, he was a better photographer than perhaps they were. And he could sort of, you know, that skill that he had could actually then be sort of actualized in a community that perhaps otherwise would not have had that opportunity. But at the same time, you know, they, since there were no money exchanged either, you know, there was this kind of, you know, something happened beyond what we usually pay for and what, what we consider something worth. And Renée Lacroix, she had a, needed a change of her lining in her trench coat. And she went to the local community center that also had a, had a sewing workshops there and they transformed into her lining into big patchwork of the leftover fabrics there and so what what they did such a nice work so she could also wear it inside out so they were very you know they took this very seriously um, and what she did in the end was that she she embroidered also or they embroidered the the zip code of where this area in Bethnal Green in London and then there's a museum there there's a museum of childhood that is part of the Victoria and Albert Museum uh, so she had it exhibited in the entrance and then had an auction for the coat where then people could bid on the coat and all the money went back to the, to the community center where people had been doing the repair in that sense, you know. So this sort of jacket took a long sort of detour in that sense, in the sense of, you know, what was added to it and where did the money go and where was it exhibited and who can exhibit things in the local museum and so on, you know. So many parts were activated here with a garment in that, and that needed a repair. You know? Of course, these are all, you know, these are all very ambitious in that sense, you know, it doesn't need to be this complicated. But I think the interesting part is really, what is the journey that a garment takes that needs repair? You know, do we take for granted that it's only me and my repair? Or can we actually think that 
it is part of a societal process where a lot of different actors can contribute and enrich each other's experiences by the way that we actually then, you know, re repair our community, but also learn to talk to people in the train, in the local community center, you know, actively think that we are actually part of the local museum. We can actually <laughs> bring things there that can be part of the community. So the way that we can sort of think of repair is not exactly that it's sort of a, a secluded practice that only concerns me and my garment and the previous state that I'm after, but we can actually sort of open the process to engage with society and processes that we want to see more of in society, perhaps, you know, and use our garments as an excuse. And some of the students were very much, this hasn't to do anything to do with fashion, you know, whereas others were a little bit more, well, you know, wow, could, could this be part of a repair service system? You know, could this be part of what a brand tries to do in a sense that it really tries to curate these kind of journeys as part of what a brand does rather than just sort of sell ready to wear garments off the hanger at the, at, at, in the store. So, so, you know, we can have different approaches to what this could imply. But this kind of repair was something that I found fascinating and working more with. So um, I worked in another kind of project called, uh, which I call Refugee Ref uh, Restoration at the Green Gulch Zen Monastery when I was invited to do a little small lecture at CCA in, in San Francisco. And this is just, you know, an hour's trip north of San Francisco. Um, and I had read uh, about this center before. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, one of the, sort of the classic 60s um, um, Zen centers of, of American Buddhism. Uh, but I was fascinated, especially by the uh, sort of the Buddhist tradition of the Rakusu. So the Rakusu is after you take your, uh, uh, your sort of vows uh, with, within Buddhist faith, you make a rakusu as a sort of, uh, it's a almost like a little bib that you carry around the neck, but it's sort of a, a, a show of your faith, if you want to say so. And traditionally it's made out of 30 small pieces and sort of the legend says that it represents the Buddha's garment that was made out of you know, patchworks that he put together of garment or, or fabrics that were left at the pyres after they had you know, burned, uh, corpses of dead people, the leftover fabrics was what he took the lowest of the fabrics in order to produce his own garments. So in, 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 in some Buddhist lineages, historically, you would make a rakusu out of patches of dead monks or nuns garments. So the small patches, the patchwork, where the fabrics would actually come from your lineage, actually from the dead monks in your lineage and their, their robes would be cut up into becoming pieces for the rakusus of the future Buddhist monks. So you, know. so you would actually wear previous pieces and, and, and shape your commitment to this you know, faith uh, by actually you know, recycling pieces of old garments and into this you know, symbol of your faith. And on the back, you actually get your new name written, which it becomes you know, so your monastery name and so on. You know. so, so I thought it was a super fascinating way of thinking of how do we also, you know, not only sort of commit to, to you know, faith in that sense, but to a sort of a lineage and, and how this lineage and this patchwork ties us together. So, to, so what we did in this little workshop was that Maya here was giving a talk about, you know, the, the production of the Rakusu that you do yourself, you sew your own Rakusu, now they are sold in, I think, in kits, but traditionally, you know, it would be actually made of these pieces. Um, and, and then what we did in this workshop was that in, at the Green Gulch Center in their garden, everybody also again had bought gar garments that needed some sort of mending or repair. But this time, the whole idea was that we cut them, uh, we cut out small patches from the lining, from under the collar, from some place that, you know, that was not necessarily seen. And we produced small patches out of each other's garments in order to repair each other's garments. So leaving the workshop, we would have, everybody would have a hole that they had to take out a patch from, but with that hole would also be fixed with patches from everyone else in the workshop. So we would actually have, all have sort of patched up each other's garments by committing <laughs> and actually destroying a bit of our garment in order to help patch someone else's. Of course, you can say that this was a little bit contrived, you know, that, that 
you know, uh, you know, forcing everyone to actually do this. But there's also something about this commitment to each other. You know, could we actually do think of the repair really as a tying a bond between people that actually have to sacrifice something for each other too? In that sense, I actually have to give up a little bit of my per perfect clothing in order to patch up a little bit of yours. You know, and and you know. How could we think about that? That repair is something that I also I also use something where someone else has given me something in order to repair something, to tie a bond between us, but also to really, you know, invest and feel, I mean, again, look at that, you know, we also, again, economic term, but, you know, in the sense of like, of committing to each other, you know, by actually having to sort of sacrifice a peach, piece of clothing to each other. So again, you know, Repair here and patching up is something that is just a little bit else, perhaps, than when we just put a patch on on the elbow or something like that, you know, um, and and just use an old garment that we have ourselves or a piece of fabric that we get. So could we think again that there's some sort of social commitments that happen again, where we actually do have to, you know, give up a little bit of our perfection in order to help patch up someone else's imperfection, if you want to say so. So a little bit what I'm trying to look at here is exactly all of these relationships that tie us to each other that have to, you know, that, that are about commitment somehow, you know, whereas the normal sort of fashion system and ready to wear and consumerism exactly asked us not to commit. And that is how we are brought up, not to having to commit, you know, how can we train to having to commit and can, can repair be a way for us to examine and think more about what these commitments could be to each other in that. Uh, and then sort of finally, this sort of brought into to thinking more about, you know, well, what could, what could we sort of learn from, from religious approaches, you know, and this kind of almost mysticism that happens in a sort of a deeper engagement with the world, with matter, with belief system and our values. And I thought it was fascinating that so many of my students sort of treat fashion uh, or the way that we sort of brought up to think about fashion is a little bit like fashion is this big thing external to us. Fashion happens in Paris, in the offices in London, in, you know, some design studio in New York, in, in the Vogue office or something like that. Fashion happens at this kind of, you know, cathedrals in these, you know, fashion is always bigger than ourselves. It's always out there. It's always, you know, as something glorious, powerful. But I thought it was fascinating that that is one narrative when also, of course, when it comes to religion and the idea of God, you know, and so on, that is this external, you know, entity that we have to submit to and keep low, be, be low in relation to. But of course, there's also within, you know, if you take Christian mysticism and, and so on, there's also this emphasis, emphasis on you know, the woundedness in that sense, you know, that <laughs> Christ is born, you know, in a, in a stable, you know, as a little child that needs care, you know, there's a lot of woundedness, you know, it is, you know, a God with wounds that, that, that Christianity practices, which is very different than many other types of faiths. And there's something about that woundedness and, and idea of healing that can happen through contemplation and, and religious types of practices that I found, well, you know, could we think of fashion also as something there? Again, if we think of fashion as sort of the attention and adoration, if we think of fashion as a conflict that, you know, I need to look better than others, I need to look, you know, you know that, that there's a lack of attention in the world and we need to claim it. Of course, this is something very different. You know, here instead, perhaps what we talk about is, is fashion as a form of, you know, vulnerability, that I actually open myself up to being judged. You know, I actually dare to do something in order to, to uh, you know, put myself out there. In that sense. Um, we can also think of that fashion is a, is a care that we, in a sense, take of our community. You know, that some people are dressing up just to make our everyday life more beautiful, if you want to say so. You know, not because they want to compete with others, but also that little extra attention that you put into dress is just wonderful to see someone passing on the street who, who just put in that attention and, and 
made a nice outfit. And you're just like, wow, thank you for, for that attention because it, it shines up my world where everybody is slouching around in this COVID time. So, you know, in their, in their coffee clothes, in itself, you know. So, so that's sort of thinking too, that what care does is also a little bit, you know, of, of, of placing ourselves, possibly being vulnerable, but also committing in a little sense to, to our community. You know? So I was playing with this, you know, that this, a whole strand of, of theologians and religious thinkers that think of, of emphasizing the woundedness of the world and the woundedness of, of re our relationship to God and, and our you know, belief systems in that sense. That is very different from asking for miracles to happen and sort of looking at God as this all-powerful all thing, you know, that, that we're going to commit to and then sacrifice to and obey, and then we get some sort of reward. You know, so many there's a strands of, of feminist theology and so on that really emphasize that that you know God does not have any hands in the world. We have to be the hands of God. You know that we have to help repair God. God is not this big external entity. God is instead a little ember in each and one of us that needs this little attention and little care in order to to you know to burn to 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 you know to to survive and and to flourish and i thought this is super fascinating because how would i teach fashion to my students if i would try to teach them about the woundedness of the world that we're all wounded and the way we use fashion to try to sort of help us survive our wounded state and our state of vulnerability but we don't necessarily do it in order to outshine others and be totally crazy, you know, and all that, you know. But we're trying to do it because we want to give each other that little sense of attention that you are seen, that I see you, you know, not that I'm trying to be what my influencer tells me, or I'm trying to look like a movie star, but instead I'm trying to look at you as a human that is wounded and that need also a sense of repair. How would I teach my students fashion from a, such a perspective that they are much more healers, if you want to say so, much more coaches, much more doctors, in a sense, than they are cultural producers and big authors, or, or, or you know, that they're going to produce this kind of mass media that's going to convince people of how glorious the designer is. You know, how would I, how would we approach the world if, you know, if we would, uh, you know, start with a sort of a weakness of fashion, a weakness of these relationships? And really try to sort of, you know, help each other heal. What, what would a fashion designer be in that? So I was just sort of playing with these ideas. And I, you know, what if there was a fashion mystic? I just sort of tried, let's just invent a fashion mystic that has another concept for fashion. As, you know, that invented a concept that calling fason or something like that, you know, that is much more about vulnerability and opening a sort of a window to the soul rather than trying to sort of, you know, convince you about my in, in you know my individuality and how glorious i am and how original i am you know instead it's much more about opening a channel between people so that they would see each other and appreciate what they give to each other um, this would be a sort of a sort of a, a, a change in a sense of the way that we would see fashion and i thought perhaps a fun thing would be to invent a fashion mystic you know what if i you know invented that there was a fashion mystic that actually sort of you know practiced this so I just put, you know, I made myself an archive box with sort of mystical objects um, of an invented fashion mystic that I put into the archive of University of Gothenburg, uh, University of Gothenburg in their library. Uh, and sort of then sort of photographed as if it was an artifact that I then had to sort of open and try to understand what is this, this type of alternative fashion practice that was practiced by a tailor that was trying to repair garments, but doing it with this real sense of commitment. And then, you know, so I sort of, you know, invented myself as this, you know, archive researcher, got my white gloves on, I tried to open this thing, you know, as if, you know, this was something totally new. Of course, I, I you know, I had invented it, but, but the whole idea was, you know, what if we took this seriously as a practice that was out there and that left real traces on the world, like this archive box of someone who had a practice and sort of mystical tools and really committed to repair in a sort of you know, religious way, you know, in, with, with the full sense of commitment and their whole worldview was in, in this practice. 
Of course, there's also traditions of this. You know, there is a, you know, a strand of Christian mysticism, everything from Jakob Böhme, who was a, a cobbler, to, um, um, I mean, a series of Swedish also um, mystics that were tailors and called, you know, that, that were actually having, you know, the, they were not in monasteries. They were, you know, lay people, you know, doing about their daily work as, as you know, as, as citizens, but also as craftspeople, you know, so exactly, Burma was a, was a cobbler, you know, so they also worked with fashion in that sense. And I thought that was a super fascinating uh, connection here, you know. So I, I invented again, you know, it's a small, you know, quirky, objects that could sort of speak about what this kind of practice was. And almost like if it was a sort of, you know, objects of contemplation, objects of, of you know, like relics, if you want to say so, uh, of, you know, repair kits that were, you know, <laughs> exactly a lot of iconographies and these kind of things, but also sort of notebooks that were sort of following this process and trying to sort of untangle a sort of a history of, of, of um, uh, an art history of, of um, religious, drawings and things as if they were speaking about this relationship with clothing and when what repair means in that sense so also producing the sort of you know notes and so on that i then also put into this box and it became a little sort of self-published book where i tried to put myself in the role of having discovered this even though of course it's all my own writing but having this you know second perspective on it where i invent this person that was a repair you know mystic that then sort of speak about and and, and what this Yilis girl does is sort of writing small aphorisms too about you know how could we really thought think you know so so in a, in a, in a similar ways of Augustinus and other types of, of of religious writers too you know what are sort of short concise sort of almost poems that the the mystic would write in order to start to 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 capture in language this relationship where Fashion on one hand tries to be this overwhelming uh, practice of, of adoration, exactly, and 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 commitment, and, and sorry, not commitment, but but um, veneration of you know something larger in that sense. But what is this other mode of thinking about the world that is much more committed to the craft and much each other and to this vulnerability of the world? It doesn't try to overpower. Instead, it tries to open these windows of vulnerability, whichever you know that that. You'll see this if you want it. <laughs> so to sort of wrap this up, what I find fascinating is in a sense, you know, coming back to the way we, you know, if, if we look back at, you know, a philosopher like Socrates, there's an interesting um, approach to the way that, and this is something that Cornelius, Cornelius Castoriadis is, is talking about in his, you know, perspective on, on, on Socrates, that what Socrates does and why Socrates was so formative and has become such an sort of icon of, an of, of philosophy too, is because it happens at the same time as the sort of the democracy, early democracy of Athens where he was active. So what Socrates does is producing a sort of an individual self-reflection with the Socr Socratic questioning comes up to people to ask them to question their values. Can you show me the way to the harbor? You know, oh yes, okay. You know, can you show me the way to happiness? You know, can you show me the way to justice? You know, these are much more complex questions. But what Socrates tries to do is to get people to question these values and to question their assumptions of the world. But it happens at the same time as there is also a mode of societal self-reflection, which is then democracy in, in Athens, you know, and of course imperfect and so on. But the question of justice individually makes it possible to also question of what is a just society on a societal level. So there's a, ten, there's a connection and a tension between individual self-reflection and a societal self-reflection. But what Socrates tries to do by being a public philosopher walking around in the city and asking these questions to people is actually to connect the two. And I think we can do a similar thing with thinking of repair. You know, one way is thinking of an individual type of self-reflection, individual questioning of our own values, our own relationship to our history, our ancestors, you know, our own relationship to garments we inherit, their own relationships to, you know, our, you know, our deeper commitments and, and values and I mean, religious beliefs, for example. But it's also connected to, you know, what do these mean to society? How do they actualize other types of 
social relationships and values that we share between people. Because you know, perhaps there is something that as I repair my socks, you know, and I repair this darn this little hole in my socks, hopefully I can start darning another pair of socks, you know, that once I have started repairing this hole, there's a bigger chance that I will start repairing the second one, you know. And hopefully, you know, I can also start repairing my jacket or my jeans or something like that, you know. But hopefully this sense of care that I invest in there, you know, is also something that can translate to society in larger, you know, perhaps I also start committing to people, to friends differently, because I actually practice on my, on my sock, <laughs> you know, that by practicing to commit to my, go, you know, my own garments, my own world in that sense, and, and reteaching myself these, these practices, perhaps I can also then, you know, translate this into a society that is more caring, a society that is much more offers the possibility of vulnerability, but without fear, you know, that offers a possibility of people, you know, feeling the possibility of freedom uh, and, and daring again to dress up like they did when they were four years old and they loved to dress up in that sense, you know, because if we can imagine that we can produce a society that is more open to such vulnerabilities, we could perhaps also imagine a society that is a bit more allowing of Exactly, showing a vulnerability and showing of, of, of uh, you know, uh, opening these windows to the soul to each other rather than trying to sheath ourselves in thicker and thicker armors and thicker and thicker, you know, accumulation of goods and health insurances and whatever that is going to make us immune to society in that sense and trying to overpower others with our splendor. You know, can we use fashion instead as a tool for elaborating on weakness? and allowing people to be vulnerable and weak and you know, expose more of their soul and experiment too with their soul too. You know. Okay, so this is just how I tried to sort of, you know, frame a discussion around these things. You know, these were, you know, three practical examples where I tried to sort of tie together one way of looking at patching and, and repairs that is just, you know, on a material level, yes, they're there, but they all try to sort of open and question our social relationships and the relationships that society builds with us that perhaps in many ways conflict with well, the way we take fashion for granted and the way that fashion is promoted to us. And again, you can see more of these examples and discussions on selfpassage.info where you can also download there all the PDFs of this book of Yilis Girl, the, the community repair uh, project and the descriptions of those and discussions also on this refuge and restoration project and, and, and of course other things that I've been working on, you find at selfpassage.info. Okay, I hope that was- Yeah, that, that was great, thank from. you. Yeah, thank you, Otto. Thank you for this uh, inspiring talk. I have lots of questions, uh, but I will ask one so that, you know, just to, to use a, a, a bit of authority, which is given to me, you know, by this mic, uh, which is, yes, which is now uh, on. Um, I'm interested uh, in, in, in the reaction of the students uh, you offered uh, that uh, those projects uh, to work on. So uh, what they experienced in, in mending and repairing? Uh, oh. You offered. Yeah. Uh, Something happening to, I don't know why, to the microphone. I hope it's okay, okay. now. <laughs> yeah. Hold yes. It, it. yes. Oh, yeah, good. So what, what was their reaction? So uh, were they capable of doing things? Did they have to learn anything before they started? Uh, so could you just say a few things about that? Yes, of course. I mean, uh, so on, 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 a, on a sort of conceptual level, you know, perhaps they were questioning what, what does this have to do with fashion education? You know, what does this have to do with making a collection and these kind of things, you know? So, which of course I can perfectly also see that that can be a big of a sort of conceptual jump in that sense, you know? Um, I think also, of, of course, there was also a struggle with the, the skills themselves, you know, that just this kind of small hand darning and, and such techniques are not something that we practice very much, you know, to, it, it may feel a little bit, um, you know, perhaps if you look at the images, you know, seen, I mean, uh, you know, on repairs out there in the world, you know, 
on, on Japanese mending techniques. They have this beautiful, you know, where every every stitch is equally long and they're all in straight, perfect lines. And you know, and it's, it's it's super hard to get that through several layers of fabric, you know. So so of course there was those kind of of, of challenges. But I think again, you know, perhaps the, the main conceptual challenge was to to overcome this idea that that you old you use old stuff. And the whole idea is that it's old stuff that is remaining old. You know? It's not even a form of upcycling that you're doing. I think to many students, a little bit of a disappointment in that sense that it, it felt like they were you know, um, um, shrinking their, their creative possibilities, you know, that, that we take for granted that at the fashion school, you should make new stuff and they should be flamboyant and it should be, you know, uh, um, sort of fantastic, you know. So this was a little bit like, wow, you know, does this even matter? Why, why would I do this? This is a little bit, you know, you know. So, so that was a little bit of, of of the immediate approach. And again, like like I said earlier, very, you know, the the main most common comment was about like, what does this have to do with the industry? What does this have to do with the way that I will actually work in the industry? That we don't do, this is not happening in the industry. Why, sh why should we, you know, this is art, you know, this has nothing to do with the industry. So that, that was what it, perhaps the main obstacle, if you want to say so, that, that I encountered. How did you, how did you, how did you respond to this? Uh, how, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, to, to me, I think, I mean, well, See it as something conceptual, then you know. See it as something where you 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 know you practice another way of thinking. At the same time, I, I always try to come back to my students in the sense that the, the, the of course Parsons, students come to Parsons to get a foot into the industry. You know that that is the big you know it is in New York. You know that so this is part of the charm you know of it in that sense. You know you don't come to Parsons to perhaps question the industry and go against the industry. You know. So, so uh, the students are really aimed at the industry in that sense. So, so by saying that the industry should be not be there or something, you know, is is not very you know helpful to them. They may, may feel. Um, at the same time, you know, the struggle is that it, it happens in so many other design disciplines too. Is that you know the majority, the ninety five percent of the students are fighting for 5% of the jobs. You know, they all want to get into Dior or you know, some, some of these amazing fashion houses that they read all about and that is you know, filling the media uh, feeds to them. You know. But there's all these other ways of being a fashion designer that nobody really wants to go exploring or so few uh -oh. want to go exploring. And so, so to me, I think the challenge here really is you know, how, 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 how do we see the fashion industry and the fashion sector as so much more than what we see on the catwalk. You know, what are so many other types of practices we can do and we can practice fashion in so many other ways than just feeding the current sort of funnel of ready to wear cheap fashion in that. So, or, or, you know, of course, students wanna to go to, the, to the, the fancy fashion houses in that sense, but there's so many other ways of being a fashion designer, you know, that perhaps we can practice fashion in much more community engaged ways. Perhaps we can fashion, practice fashion much more closer to, to you know, the sector of healing, if that is the sector of like spiritual types of healing to also like, you know, in, when I go to see my, my psychologist, perhaps I should be so, <laughs> you know, if I'm going to, to you know, um, and we, which other form of sort of coaching in that sense and, and ways of actually shaping and feeling that I have an agency to shape my life that is perhaps where fashion designers should be offering their services. You know, so just like we have this whole sector of lifestyle coaches, stylists, da, 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 you know, of, of people that are working on a much more uh, sort of a deeper level than just commodities, if you want to say so. That's perhaps where fashion designers also could be working. So that's a little bit of how I try to sort of get my students to think about this. That that perhaps this repair that they're doing here is a way of thinking of a wider scope of where mm -hmm. fashion practices happens in society and what fashion designers can do and contribute to society more than the very narrow sector of, of commerce that mm -hmm. where it is now. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Thank you. And just following that, uh, Olga Gurova is with us on YouTube. And uh, yes, she, she says hi. And in our chat, you can see her questions. Uh, how would you redefine fashion if we shift our focus from the grand narratives of fashion capitals, fashion houses, and toward more humble and empath empathic narratives of effect uh, vulnerability? Yeah, I mean, so, so what I play with in this in this little book is I, I try to call it another name, you know, by calling it Fazon. I mean, perhaps I should have had a, you know, a name that is, is just somewhat much more radically different. The tricky part in general here that I feel I'm sort of running up against the whole time is that the way that, I mean, we have a very imprecise language around fashion in general. And this is something that I think fashion theory and fashion scholars in general and fashion scientists suffer from that when we talk about fashion, most often we talk about the industry, you know, we talk about it as you know, what is in the stores. At the same time as, as it's itself, the concept has all these tensions within it, you know, that it's, it is the new, the newest fashion at the same time as it's not so new that it's, it's too groundbreaking, you know, it is actually in mass production. So it's not totally unique. You know, so, and, and at the same time, you know, we, we talk about fashion as exactly what is in trend right now, even though it is recurring from, you know, earlier styles and so on. So, so within the concept of self of fashion, we talk about a lot of different things. You know, we talk about, you know, everything from, from, you know, a competition and a conflict between people that you, you want to look different than others. At the same time, as we use the same word for the possibility of looking exactly the same like others, but, you know, and this is the tension that is in fashion, but the way that, we, we speak about it is, is, is perhaps unhelpful to us because we would perhaps need much better accurate terms to talk about all these different aspects of fashion that we're, that we're talking about, you know. So on one hand, we talk about fashion as this possibility of adoration, you know, that we want people to look at us and be seen and acknowledged by people, you know. At the same time, as we talk about fashion as this idea that we can reveal something hidden, that, you know, that we are, you know, etc. So, so <laughs> so just to sort of take it shortly, I mean, we are facing a, a very tricky business in that sense. We are facing, you know, how, how are we, and this is perhaps the, the challenge for us scholars in that sense, to find better words, better terms to point at all these parts of fashion. It's not that we should take away the concept of fashion because it's such, you know, it, it is a, you know, a, a, a fantastic term to put <laughs> a very living practice of life there, you know, but we perhaps could use, you know, better terms to try to sort of break it apart to what are the parts of fashion that we're actually talking about, we talk about the industry, or do we, do, do we talk about the catwalk, which is very different than the industry, you know, um, are we talking about the type of things we see in the art galleries that very few people are actually wearing, you know, are we talking about the very everyday practice, the type of barren fashion that we all mostly end up in, which is basically then just the hoodie and something that we wear in our everyday life, which of course is part of the current look, but it's not fashion. And whatever, it's just, you see, there's, there's so many things in that whole realm that we should take apart in order to, to better know what we're talking about and perhaps point to what aspects we're talking about in, in, in fashion. Mm -hmm. But that didn't really answer the question, but I'm sorry, that was just about you know, trying to sort of challenge one understanding that is so dominant where we almost all the time, and especially at fashion school, we talk about fashion and we only talk about the industry. And we need to be better at taking this apart and talk about many types of fashion and invent languages that speak about what all these small worlds are. You know, that, that's my short, <laughs> shorter answer. Uh, yeah, and actually there is a continuation uh, to that question. Why, why do you actually need uh, this shift to uh, other empathic type of narratives uh, today? So why, why do you think it's happening uh, these days? I mean, a, a central part to me is, of course, the, 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 the big challenge of sustainability. The big challenge that the, that the fashion system faces is that it you know, public awareness is erasing, arising of the, 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 the enormous costs that the current fashion paradigm has, you know. So there's an urgency in trying to fix fashion somehow and make it more sustainable. The tricky part, though, is that, you know, when we use a term that is dominated by the fashion industry, which means that we're trying to make the fashion industry sustainable, we're not trying to make 
fashion in general or all these various types of practices sustainable. Some of them already are sustainable, like many forms of repair. Other types of you know, um, inheriting clothes and so on. You know, there's many practices in fashion that is already fairly sustainable. You know, it's one part that we talk about all the time, which is the current fashion system and making this type of habitual consumption uh, more sustainable, which leads us also to certain kinds of solutions. Okay, so we talk about, oh, you know, a little bit more eco-cotton, a little bit more, blah, 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 you know, but we're restricting the whole discussion to just sustaining the industry, whereas we could empower and make more interesting this whole other realm of fashion practices that are out there, which are exactly, you know, repair, inheriting, you know, various types of sharing and all these kind of things, you know. So again, you know, if, if we put all our attention into the fashion system only, perhaps we forget that we could reinvent the Christmas gift, you know, or if you're not text, you know, that how do I make a gift of my dad's old sweater or something, you know, as I'm giving someone else this inherited sweater, but what is the ritual that makes that meaningful? What is the ritual that makes that garment feel charged with these values that the fashion industry thrives on, you know, in popularity, all this, there's so much glam and glitter around the fashion industry. How can we sort of feel that what are ways of doing that when it comes to sharing, when it comes to gift giving of inheriting, when it comes to repairs, when it comes to all these other fashion practices that are already sustainable, what if we put our, you know, our attention to those and try to figure out ways in which we can take some of the energy that comes from the current system into these practices to re them and revive them in ways that make us still feel fresh and new and that my life is full of poss possibilities and that I have the possibility of someone seeing me or whatever, you know, all these things that are otherwise so rich in the industry can that also become, you know, as, as sort of glamorous, if you want to say so, with these other types of practices that are already sustainable. So how can we, how can we think of that exactly again, not only patching up the system, but have a richer way of talking about what fashion practices are and find better vocabularies for that and better examinations of all these practices so that we can also have a wider perception of a sustainable fashion system that includes much more than just patching up and making a little bit eco cotton and a little bit of circularity and a little bit of you know what we're trying to do with this industry focused discussion on sustainable fashion mm -hmm. okay that was again a long answer to, to, but i think the urgency is exactly here that we have we're facing this enormous change and with all the the current reports and all these things just lead us to patching up the industry and we almost like forget all these other practices that we could try to and live in and make much more interesting and, and use our creative and cultural creds, if you want to say so, to make much more thriving and much more vibrant, you know, uh, and yes. Okay. So, so I hope that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, let's, yeah, just see if there are any questions or comments here. Uh, questions, comments, some ideas. One question at least. Oh, oh yes. I have I, I have a few, but yeah, Irina. Oh, but Irina. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Please. Yeah. Thank you so much for such an inspiring lecture. I also wanted to come back uh, to the first question of Ludmila uh, related to uh, education uh, with the students. And uh, I am really curious to know uh, if you noticed some behavioral changes uh, of uh, of your students. Like, uh, did they move a bit far from uh, this individual ego more to collective ego, maybe, and started to work uh, with more collaborative projects after your course? Or yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I don't think I can I can speak directly to what happened to my my students in that sense, but I can definitely see that there there is definitely. A, a shift happening in the attention and the issues that my students or that students in general at Parsons in fashion seem to be raising, you know, compared just to sort of 10 years ago, there's a much more of an awareness of sustainability and, you know, community questions, questions of justice and production. That is, it's much more present amongst the students, you know, so, so, I, and I, of course, I can't say that has anything to do with my, my, my project, but, but there is definitely, I, I sense that there is a change in interest around these things. And of course, 
these parties that I now talked about, they were 10 years old, you know. So perhaps, you know, if I would now revive these and try to work a little bit more closely to these, you know, studios now with a similar approach, perhaps, the, the, you know, the, the ground would be fertile in a different way. And I, I think the students would perhaps you know, be much more responsive today than, than uh, the sort of, that it seemed very abstract 10 years ago. So, so there's definitely, you know, I, I cannot exactly to say that, that this is something that, that came out of my project, but I, I can sense that, you know, there, there is another climate now to discuss and, and, uh, and put attention to, to these issues. And just to continue yeah. this question about, uh, you know, students, uh, Lisa asks if, if those who worked on mending uh, projects, did they wear those clothes or was it, was it, were they clothes actually? Which you mended, yeah. Yes, yes, and 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 this is a tricky question. You know, this is a tricky question when it comes to all kind of upcycling and recycling and these kind of things. Too, like, do people actually wear these things? It's fun to do, <laughs> you know, but are we really thinking that people are going to wear these things? Of course, you know, repairs are, you know, there's a certain there's certain groups of people that get away with that. You know, that we have to see that. You know. Uh, it's a similar way of, of, you know, making your own clothes or making clothes for my child. You know, if I do that today, it's, it, you know, if, if, if a child shows up at daycare in homemade clothes, it shows that there's a family that can put enough attention, has the time to do this, you know, because it's so much cheaper to, to buy it on a second hand or whichever, you know. So it actually shows not necessarily that you're poor, but it, the opposite, that you are rich enough to actually do this. So repair means something else and showing repair means something else today than perhaps before. Similarly, also, you know, we can see that, you know, being an academic and going to art school in repaired clothes, that's, you know, oh, that's quirky auto, cool, you know, whereas, of course, you know, if I am going to, uh, you know, a job that is very, and, and I may have come from a poor background and trying to dress myself up, you know, then, of course, I, you know, having, showing visible mending and repairs is not necessarily supported and feel safe for me you know so we definitely need to be very aware of we, who is the audience that can pull this off and who who is the audience that can then perhaps be the trendsetters to allow others in order to 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 show up in this way and that's of course if you see what i'm saying you know that that we cannot take for granted that everybody can wear these repaired garments and and so on uh, again you know and, and there's also a question here about you know you know um Many of the most sustainable garments that we do have, you know, exactly. If I wear, you know, certain garments in my dacha, you know, uh, and, and I think this is also an issue that certain kind of garments are allowed to have a longer life because they are in a certain environment, you know, and and perhaps you know in uh, exactly, you know, I, I think in Norway they even have a term for it that you that you on purpose wear old clothes up in your cabin. You know, because the whole idea is that you, in a sense, take off your professional role from the city where you try to be a certain kind of, you know, professional person. And in the cabin, or I guess, you know, in the Dutch, similarly, you, you strip off, in that sense, that realm of publicness in order to be uh, much more familiar with each other. In that sense, that's and then we almost like, you know, we wear these old clothes that smell of summer house <laughs> because we want to show that we are actually committing more ourselves to each other and we actually take away the struggles and perhaps the conflicts in the sense that we could have out in in public life so again these are also two different realms you know that on one hand we can say that perhaps we connect fashion as the term to this urban life you know whereas we have you know another type of clothing situation and clothing relationships that happen in the Dutch chain that's with repairs and all these kind of things you know so, so we actually you know have very different dressing practices in different spaces and it's actually coming back to them you know can I have my <laughs> the practices that make sense in the Dutch or in the in the summer cabin can they make sense in the city and I think that's again you know we, we need to be aware of that not everybody can do so yes you can do so as a cultural producer and that's a you know as a in a realm where there's a lot more wiggle room and a much more appreciation for you know type of inner practices if you want to say so whereas it won't work perhaps if I'm you know working in an office and I'm supposed to have this suit 
in order to appear professional and not be myself, you know, not be my Dutch self. The whole idea is that I, I'm not allowed to wear that self because I should be a, you know, a professional lawyer. You know? And it's going to take us a struggle to think about like, you know, but what are the mending techniques that is going to make sense for the office or for the lawyer or for the, you know, someone that has to have that public persona? You know, what is the sort of the fashion practices that we can think of there? Uh, what, how would that repair service look like? if it's going to be a repair service that prolongs the life of a suit versus prolongs the life of, you know, of the theater producer's sweater, <laughs> you know, and it's very different types of repairs, perhaps, you know, and we need to be aware that these are different realms and, and, and have their own codes. Uh, it, yeah. So, so, yeah. And, and I do wear a lot of repairs. Yes. But they send I mean, I can do that as a teacher, you know, I can do that as, you know, it can be a statement coming to Parsons where a lot of my students are, you know, uh, can dress in, can afford to dress in ways that I can not afford, you know, uh, because it becomes a little bit of a statement in the sense coming also in repair and sort of, you know, sort of fighting back a little bit uh, in, and coming there in my, in my repaired pieces. So, so, yes, all right. Oops. <laughs> Uh, yeah. And I, I have actually a question about um, something you said when you spoke about fashion and mending and repairing. You uh, repeated a few times uh, the word survival. I'm sorry, my dog is coming, wants to say something, I guess. Uh, survival. And uh, it seems like uh, very often uh, fashion is about resistance. And uh, it made me think about uh, the recent uh, lockdowns, you know, when people started to actually take care a little bit more about the things they had, and they started probably to think about mending. Do you think this, uh, these are connected, uh, the, the pandemic experience and uh, the, the, the fact that we really started to think more about the clothes and maybe the, in, in, uh, you know, empathy, which Olga asked about, uh, has somehow been increased, uh, this kind of need for em empathy uh, increased uh, due to uh, COVID times. I, yeah, and I, in, in one way, yes, I, I can, you know, I think the sort of the lockdown, uh, you know, helped us be introvert in many ways, in a sense, you know, and, and rethink what we do and what we wear and how, and do we really need all these, all these things that we committed, you know, that we before took for granted to do. Um, at the same time, I guess it's also, you know, a sense of um, uh, perhaps also, I mean, as, as much as there is an, a, a sense of, of um, um, a possibility of being introvert and, and re-question our values, you know, I think there's also, a, you know, um, an appreciation for what we had, if you want to say so too, you know, that perhaps people will, oh, I really want to buy more stuff, you know, because I've been locked up, not buying things, you know, I want, really want to go out and see people and see myself being seen by people, etc. you know, that there may also be that aspect of it, you know, but of course, no, hopefully, you know, we have had some space to think and, you know, take a step back in order to sort of see where we were before, you know, because, you know, when we're in it, we don't think about it, you know, at the same time, you know, I think in the beginning of the pandemic and in the lockdown, there was a lot more hope about that now was the time to really question a lot of consumption and a lot of you know, these things that we took for granted. And, and I, my response to that has, has, has been in a sense that, you know, so a, a lot of religious practices, again, you know, they use fasting, fasting as a way to, to be conscious about to bring back attention to ourselves and our world and our, our situation in that sense, you know. Uh, and, and fasting can be a pathway towards you know, sort of enlightenment or, you know, a, a more, you know, uh, 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 enlightened relationship to oneself in that sense, you know. But starvation does not, you know, when you don't choose to do it, it's not your choice that doesn't produce endless enlightened people, you know? So if there's a famine, it just doesn't just sort of produce a population of enlightened Buddhas walking around in the neighborhoods, you know? No, you know, so there's a, there's a difference between the self-imposed reflection that we could do in the pandemic in that sense, you know, and versus the one that is sort of imposed by the condition of the pandemic. You know, and I don't think we should confuse the two because I think 
you know, um, um, yes, as much as we have had the possibility of, of looking at our consumption, I think it also, we also realize that as society opens up, you know, the, the, the tensions have not disappeared. You know, the way that people have, you know, expect me to look at this law office or something that has just not changed, that suddenly I can show up in this repaired, you know, I can show up in law office with my sweater or something like that, you know, that has not necessarily changed, you know. So, so on one hand, yes, it, it offers us some possibility, but the conditions in society as society opens up again has not necessarily made it feasible for us to change our practices. If, if I want to, you know, if I'm a little bit more skeptical about <laughs> the possibilities of that. Yeah, I see. Well, yes, uh, this is, yeah, I, th I think this, this uh, question is still open. Uh, what, yes. Well, of course, cer certainly so, you know, and, and uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I think there is a possibility of, of how do we as designers offer the possibility of fasting, if you want to say so, to our customers in that sense and help them guide, guide them through that process rather than feel starved, mm -hmm. you know. How do they turn their starvation, if you want to say so, into a journey that leads them somewhere else? And similarly, how can we think about sustainability? If you want to implement sustainability to people and make people more sustainable, you cannot necessarily, perhaps, you know, perhaps the best option is not to just strip them of the opportunities to, to buy things, but to lead them and handhold them onto a journey of another type of self-discovery than what the store offers us today, in that sense, you know, that... And when I encounter, when I go to the store to discover myself, I discover myself by buying stuff that I put on myself that someone else has told me looks great on me, you know. Whereas if I'm actually, you know, if I could practice sustainably with clothing, it could be much more of a journey towards self-discovery that I take throughout different steps that we as designers could help people, could help provide for people in that sense, you know, we could there's endless of things we could learn from there in that sense of like, how could garments, rather than patch up myself, my bad self-esteem, you know, actually grow my self-esteem, you know, what would be ways of practicing fashion in that way, you know, that it is, you know, the, the path to self-discovery rather than every new season, give me new garments in that sense, you know, that I should be wearing because I feel so bad about myself that I need to buy something new in order to feel better about myself. Yeah, yeah. That's a little bit like, you know, how the fashion industry operates right now you know that you know as fashion designers if i'm going to survive i need to be your sugar daddy i need to make you addicted to my stuff otherwise you won't come back and buy my stuff you know so i need you know i need to make you feel just good enough about yourself momentarily <laughs> but then soon enough you're going to feel bad about yourself again so you come back and buy my stuff you know so so i, I you know we operate fashion operates in a very sad cycle in that sense. Can we as designers try to sort of push this in another direction that yeah. exactly could be more sustainable, but also perhaps hopefully, you know, also richer, more meaningful. Yeah. Or would they prefer just to feed the same beast? Oh yes, of course. I mean, and and th th there's a tension there and, and it's not that we're gonna you know, find the answer overnight, but, <laughs> but um, uh, I, I, you know, hopefully, you know, part of these kind of repairs, part of this with the patching up, the things that, you know, hopefully we find in this forum too, mm -hmm. are ways to take this question seriously and really try to figure out ways to be different fashion designers, you know, and, and, and find ways to enrich that palette of options that we can be fashion designers rather than only, the only option is to be the sort of the market-oriented, current market-oriented uh, producer of more ready-to-wear goods. Thank you. Uh, so I guess we have maybe just a little space for one more question or comment, uh, or maybe more, depends. Uh, well, again, uh, there, is, uh, there is a question about pandemic, which you can, uh, from Yelena, you said the pandemic gave us an opportunity to rethink our consumption, but unfortunately the sales statistics have increased after the first wave. What do you think if some kind of technology for the restoration of nature appears, the tendency to mending will go away? Oh, well, I mean, nobody, exactly. I mean, first of all, I think there's a difference between our values, as, as values are slowly changing, if you want to say so, and the practices, you know, I think, I mean, and, and more and more statistics show this, that, that when we interview customers, customers say that they care about nature at the same time as more and more of these super cheap online retailers are 
exploding in size, like shine or whatever, you know, that where most garments are like $10. I mean, it's very, even even much, you know, the whole flora of producers that are cheaper than H&M and Zara and, you know, the sort of the, the usual villains of the fashion system, of the fast fashion system and that sort of thing. So we see definitely on the statistics, people say they care, but the statistics show something totally different, you know, and, and, and exactly, you know, Perhaps the pandemic, or whichever, we, we don't, of course, cannot really know exactly what, what pushes these numbers. Uh, but I would think that, that we, you know, what we say and what we think is very different from our actual practices in that sense. You know, we live in this hypocrisy that, that, that you know, that we are part of, you know. We know we should perhaps be vegan, but very few of us are, et cetera, et cetera, you know, so that, that we, et cetera. Um, and we may think that, I mean, we, we there's, the research is hopeful that there are more technologies out there that help us do things, uh, and that is a, you know, everything from smarter fibers and you know compostable things to you know more you know ways of thinking about circularity and you know uh, different types of, of circulation of goods in that sense. Um, and of course, you know, there's been a lot of discussions on blockchains and things, you know, various types of technologies that could help us see more and have a more transparent uh, production chains and supply chains and so on. Um, and in my perspective, that is amazing. You know, that's great. There's fashion designers that work with this and I leave it to them. I think, I think it's amazing. Go for it. You know, I, I am more interested in the ways we can make fashion more meaningful the way we can make our engagement with clothing richer and more sensorially uh, explorative. And that it can be a much, much more of a journey towards something more and something else than what the current system offers in that sense. You know? so, so as much as I'm hopeful that, well, perhaps there are technological fixes and they can you know, aggregate into something fascinating, it's not really where, where my, my attention is. You know, I am much more interested in exactly you know, what other ways can we be practicing fashion and fashion design in ways that can be a richer, more meaningful practice to us. You know? and, and there's so much more, so much there that has to be unexplored. So I just feel like, whoa, there's a whole, you know, I, have a, I have a lifetime of exploration to do there because exactly that this, this uh, uh, of course, it, it, but it does get more busy. You know, there, there are more people that are that, that are trying to image and that are doing things there. So this, it's, it's very exciting that, that there's more happening there and that there's more practices that we could learn from you know, that, that we could exchange ideas from and so on. So, yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Otto. Uh, questions? Well, thank you, guys. And good luck mending. I see. Yeah. Well. Yeah. That's that's that, that's 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 actually tricky because you know I I don't have experience in in making things and I really feel uh, rather helpless uh, doing the things because we have this you know some of uh, the some of the members of our club uh, are practitioners so they're very good at it but those who are not yes uh, <laughs> but you know at the same time yeah it just feels uh, probably. Uh, just uh, the way the way we do it. I mean uh, the I mean the very uh, uh, way we look from the outside could be hilarious, so that people actually have fun, you know, while mending and seeing us. Uh, yes. So again, this is also somehow building the community uh, in a very weird <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, and I think I mean my art teacher always said like you know when you start drawing you should not be scared of the white page you know so always you can start with a little knot or just draw the first line or whatever you know just to sort of get started because the white page can be sort of overwhelming you know <laughs> and uh, I always think of it similarly like you know perhaps you just have to you know we have to also help people to take that first step of mending a sock or whatever it is and we did this little when I did a lecture together with Pascal Hudson in, in, in Arnhem, we just, you know, so, so what we did was that on each seat where people showed up, we had put a little needle and thread and little red thread and in a little card, you know, so everybody got that as they came for the talk. And then in the little break we made in the middle of the lecture, we just asked people to, to turn towards their, their, the person sitting to the right of them. And, and so this little red thread into their garments and just leave it hanging, you know, but just, you know, so that everybody would carry at this little event, this little red thread on their garment, you know, and they could choose where they wanted it on the, you know, wherever they wanted this little red thread hanging, you know, and they could easily take it off 
when you know if they later of course you know but at this moment at this time you know everybody had this little red thread on it as a little community <laughs> sign you know and and of course you know the, the the beautiful part in the sense with mending is that it can be undone you know it can be very often unpicked again you know and i think a lot is also just getting you know what what is the, that first little step the first little patch the first little just a little thread hanging somewhere just to sort of show that you're having that little opening <laughs> and have made that little mark at least you know so we just you know have what is this kind of we need to overcome in this is the pristineness that so much of fashion sells us this you know perfection that that uh, and and allow us also to feel that we can have this little agency of just adding that little red thread you know to to our things just to sort of feel how it is to actually have put that little mark on our world, you know, and you can also have to do it in the lining on your jacket or whatever if you feel that it's a bit sort of scary. But um, yeah, yeah we well, very, very, yeah, very interesting idea. Yes, we should think of something like that. Uh, I like it. So, <laughs> Next uh, time on Zoom, everybody would have a little thread yeah. hanging. Or something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, good idea. Well, so uh, even even though everyone has questions or comments, I'm sure they they do. But I, I just we need to yes let you go and uh, yes, oh. <laughs> thank you so much for for this fantastic uh, talk for for this uh, generous and inspiring conversation, and uh, you know just uh, gave us this perspective that uh, somehow mending can help patch up uh, the social fabric somehow. Well, that's that's great and uh, well. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Otto, for yes, for being with us. Well, thank you for having me. Maybe not the last time. Let's hope not the last time. Know. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thanks Great. a lot. Well, thank you. Fun. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. And I just want to say to everyone who is following us on uh, the the YouTube channel that this is uh, actually the beginning of our public program, and Mended Lab is going to continue and have a series of conversations open to everyone. So please mend, because we definitely can mend it. Okay. Okay, yeah, I just uh, hope- Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Bye. Take care. <laughs> Bye, take care, have a lovely day.